Hi, um, I'll start also by uh, the organizer, Zeynep Ujal Tunç, uh, for, the, for the invitation, but also to, you know, special thanks really to Ararat for his heroic <laughs> efforts to help me with the obstacles of visa and, and flights and, and everything. Thank you really, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what an audience. I mean, there are so many scholars in the room that inspired my intellectual uh, growth but also brilliant scholars from my generation whose work I admire. So really also a tough crowd, uh, a bit nervous. Uh, well, let's see how it goes. I'm also nervous about after what happened to Amit. So I, I will try to stick to my uh, text and um, keep the time. So um, in my talk today, what I'd like to discuss is the feminist scholarship that deals with questions revolving around the Turkish state, particularly around the dynamics of its founding gender regime as established in the early Republic. More specifically, I will focus on the feminist criticism of Kemalism, Kemalist discourse of women's emancipation and the early Republican gender policies, which were part of the so-called Kemalist reforms or secular reforms in the interwar period. Now, why do I suggest to focus on uh, feminist criticism of Kemalism and the early Republican gender policies at a conference that organized uh, at a conference that organized to commemorate the centennial of the Republic of Turkey, because this criticism has been so central to the shaping of an entire field that is women's studies and gender studies um, in Turkey. But not just that, it, its effect was beyond academia. And I would say that this criticism was also very central to the shaping of feminist praxis in Turkey until today. Um, right. So what is this uh, feminist scholarship that I'm talking about or the feminist dominant um, narrative about feminism and the early, early Republic? Now, of course, the, um, we, all know that you know uh, a new feminist movement emerged in Turkey. That, well, at least, that's in the dominant narrative in the scholarship as well. Uh, uh, from the 1980s onwards, uh, coinciding with that, we see an emergence of a new type of feminist academic literature around questions of women and and gender. Now, this doesn't mean that there were no research on women on, around questions of gender before 1980s. Actually, the field started from the late 1960s onwards, I would say, but that was a, quite a different literature in the sense that that was much more sociologically oriented, asking questions about demography, family structures, uh, and women's health, for example. So what happened from the 1980s onwards we see an emergence of what I would call radical feminist scholarship um, that shifted the focus from that, those kind of sociological questions to more historical uh, uh, questions. Um, and kind of started problematizing the modernist Kemalist discourse on women's emancipation. This also brought along a shift in scholarly attention, as I said, from more contemporary issues to historical approach, focusing specifically on uh, the early Republic and the ideological parameters of the Kemalist imagination of women, Turkish women, uh, modern Turkish womenhood. This radical feminist scholarship would still emphasize the achievements of the period, such as the adoption of a secular civil code or women's acquisition of their political rights. However, Rather than following what had been the hegemonic narrative until then, that these rights were given to women by a benevolent regime, feminist scholars from starting from the late 1980s demonstrated that these issues had long been on the agenda of the women's movement, which, which flourished in the late Ottoman Empire and became institutionalized after the establishment of the new uh, nation state in Turkish Women's Union in 1923. In other words, as they unearthed the Ottoman and early, early Republican women's activism through their pioneering research, feminist scholars successfully challenged the narrative that the Kemalist state was the sole initiator 
and thus the ultimate guardian of women's rights uh, in Turkey. And in fact, this independent women's movement inherited from Ottoman feminists, characterized often in the literature as first wave feminism, uh, was not tolerated by the single party regime. The women's union was forced to close in 1935. Uh, so this exclusion and eventual suppression of the women's movement not only marked the beginning of a troublesome history in terms of the relationship between the state and uh, women's movement, but it also put the state, and particularly its ideological manifestation, Kemalism, at the center of feminist critique and scholarly inquiry. Now, um, Feminist criticism of Kemalist modernization produced a very rich, rich literature, which I cannot possibly discuss in this uh, very short talk. But I would like to argue that there are three or key arguments of this uh, literature. The first is the class bias of the Republican gender policies. Feminist scholars claimed that the Kemalist reforms benefited mainly urban middle class women. So accordingly, while the state paved the way for a very limited number of urban elite women to become professionals and equal citizens in the public life, it left the lives of most women largely untouched. Even if it did manage to touch the lives of those women, according to this dominant reading, its message for those women was very different. Those women would be part of modernization by playing the role of educated and disciplined housewives and mothers. And so the derivative of this class bias argument would be also criticizing those elite Kemalist women for embracing and internalizing the Kemalist message and becoming uh, its bearers and doing their share for modernizing other women. Now, the second key argument uh, is that the Kemalist project of women's emancipation was inherently patriarchal and particularly keen on controlling women's bodies and uh, female sexuality. In my view, this has been the most paradigm shifting uh, contribution of the scholarship. The third argument has to do with the characterization of the Kemalist approach to women's rights as state feminism as formulated by the pioneering scholar and feminist Shirin Tekeli. According to this analysis, Kemalist modernize, uh, modernizing reforms uh, th that aimed at achieving women's rights were instrumental in nature. Women were seen mainly as objects of social change rather than active subjects. The Kemalist elite had used these reforms to underline its democratic aspirations uh, uh, and it was through these reforms that the Kemalist state could position itself as the guardian of gender equality. This argument complemented the previous two in calling to attention the problematic aspects of the Kemalist discourse of women's emancipation and how highlighted how it had indeed the effect of impeding the development of a truly feminist agenda of women's liberation. Because this state feminism, according to uh, the um, first generation of femme scholars, had contained the women's rights struggle, it resulted in the decades of silence or what they call barren years in terms of independent women's activism from the 1940s up until the 1980s, hence the first wave and the second wave, barren years in between. Um, right. So feminist scholars of Turkey reach these conclusions that I very briefly outlined by primarily focusing on the state, the founding elite of the Republic, and more specifically, the discursive and ideological manifestations of the Kemalist women's emancipation policy. In other words, they looked at how intra-elite debates and state policies took shape in Ankara especially focusing on the speeches of Mustafa Kemal and other prominent elite of the early Republic. Therefore, I would argue that as critical and transformative as it has been in, in its analysis of both the Kemalist and the revisionist scholarships, feminist scholarship has been shaped by an approach that sees the state and society in dichotomous terms, 
overestimates the power of ideology and elite discourses to shape social reality of women on the ground and underestimates the capacity of women of all strata to negotiate with male elite discourse and imaginations. Because the state and its ideological manifestations were at the center of the critique and scholarly inquiry, and because for these feminist scholars, decoding the patriarchal nature and restoring women's roles in the nation state formation were such urgent tasks, which is understandable, feminist scholarship has also focused almost exclusively on women's organized political activism. Now, as a result, we know a great deal about the ideal Turkish women celebrated by the Kemalist regime, the male elite discourses around gender identities and various manifestations of these visions and discourses in state policies, in legislation, in public debate, in newspapers, and in major elements of visual culture. We also now have very detailed studies of women's organizations, activisms in the, in the first three decades of the 20th century. However, our knowledge is much more limited when it comes to ordinary women, women living in the provinces and their experiences of the so-called Kemalist reforms in their daily lives. Now, when I started, uh, and I will build on my work on the anti-veiling campaigns, when I started my research on the anti-veiling campaigns of the 1930s and realized in the course of my research that women's experiences and responses to these campaigns cannot be fully understood within the existing framework within, uh, given by the feminist scholarship, I could only find a very small number of references that would support my search for a more nuanced analysis of the Kemalist experience. One was uh, Sibel Bozon's very insightful footnote that, and I'm quoting her here, the compelling feminist critique of Kemalism does not alter the progressiveness of the reforms as viewed in their own time, especially by women themselves who felt empowered by their rights and their new visibility in public life. And then a new generation of feminist historians kind of followed these uh, hints here and there and um, started looking um, more on the experiences of ordinary uh, women. And I would say that this new feminist scholarship demonstrated that understanding women's experiences of Kemalist uh, gender policies and their reactions to or involvement with them requires a more nuanced appraisal of the Kemalist experience than one finds in the existing feminist literature. This refined understanding needs to reflect the com complexities of the transformation of everyday lives of ordinary women and their ordinary agencies. Such an approach, I will argue, entails rethinking the class bias argument of the feminist scholarship and challenging the idea that apart from a group of urban middle-class women, women's lives were largely untouched. The assumption that, that those women who complied with the Kemalist policies were totally passive carriers of its message needs to be also revisited. These imperatives, I would argue, require linking the micro with the macro, that is, the lives of ordinary women in a certain quality to larger processes of the transformation of the gender regime. And I will now turn to the case of anti-wailing campaigns to support my arguments. Now, I don't have the time to give you a very uh, comprehensive and complicated picture uh, of these campaigns. I will just, in a nutshell, summarize you know, the very important uh, points about these campaigns. Um, so first of all, the anti-wailing campaigns, they came in two waves, uh, mid 1920s, but that's a weak wave. The main wave, what I call the main wave, came, comes in mid 1930s. It's not unique to Turkey. If you look uh, across the so-called Muslim world in the interwar period, you see very similar 
uh, campaigns, again, across uh, the region from Albania to Soviet Uzbekistan, there's actually an astonishing synchronicity of these campaigns. And these campaigns learn from each other. This is also, I think, reflects Amit's uh, point that there are constant references to what the Turks were doing, what the Arabs were doing, what the Iranians were doing, et cetera. So it's a very similar story in the anti Iranian campaigns uh, as well. So um, the main strategy Ankara followed regarding the issue of unveiling was transferred to the matter to the local level and encouraged the local administrative bodies and their actors to deal with it. In other words, there was no law or a central decision banning any type of whaling countrywide. Uh, but there were anti-whaling campaigns organized at the local level that were clearly encouraged by Ankara, although in some cases I was able to show that the incentive came from the local elite themselves. Most of these campaigns resulted in municipal bans, so the legal framework was the 1913 municipal law. Ankara's involvement in the process was complicated, and its reluctant attitude, which swayed from uh, promoting local efforts to trying to contain and limit them, it was combined with the diversity of the attitudes coming from the local elite, women, and other societal actors, resulted in a rather complex process at the local level. Moreover, although total Europeanization of women's dress was the ideal that is total uh, you know, uh, unveiling, anti-veiling campaigns only aimed at the removal of certain types of veiling, that is the face veil, peche, uh, the full body cover, uh, usually black, if you are uh, familiar with the Iranian shadow, it's very similar, and the local variants of charshaf, that is the peshtama. In other words, and I underline, covering of the hair was never openly targeted. This limited scope of the campaigns provided certain ro uh, room for women's selective adaptation and created possibilities of maintaining the existing dress norms, except for the use of the peche, charshaf, and the peshtama. And it's just a uh, a few examples just to give you also the local variety of the campaign. So in, in one prom uh, province, the local authorities ban only the face veil. In another province, it can be Peche Charge of Peche sometimes, you know, the baggy trousers of men, or um, we were having a conversation with Alioja over lunch, I can't see him, but um, the cafes, that is the lattice window. Uh, 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 um, covering the windows in the old Ottoman uh, houses. Now, um, and this is um, my uh, very humble attempt in uh, showing you a very basic map of Turkey and trying to show you the uh, spread of the campaigns. This is by no means a comprehensive list because these campaigns were local you really have to go and dig in every single pro province, even you know district capitals, to be able to see whether there was a campaign there or, or not. But this is the most comprehensive list available uh, in the literature. Now, how did the women respond to these campaigns? The short and straightforward answer to this question is that they responded in diverse ways. And this diversity cannot be reduced to the dichotomy of resistance and subordination. Some women's reaction was disobedience. There are women who, sorry, there were women who continued to wear the peche and the charge of in the public sphere, despite the existence of open bans in their cities. For example, there were women actually fined uh, by disobeying, non-complying with a municipal ban. Uh, if women didn't or couldn't challenge the ban by open disobedience, they tried to find other ways to handle them. They started using alternative means to cover themselves. For example, it is in this period that actually the types of wailing and unwailing diversified, uh, I would argue, in Turkey. It's in this period, for example, this adoption of long heads. Uh, headscarves, combining them with very long and black 
overcoat because it would look like a charge off, but it wasn't a charge off. So you would comply with the ban, but you would uh, again sort of continue with traditional practices of whaling. That became very uh, um, uh, widespread use of the French turban, uh, uh, for example, or even umbrella to cover your uh, face temporarily if you come across with a stranger man walking in the street, etc. This resistance, and I use it in quotation marks, to the bands on the Pecha and Charsha can of course be read as women's insistence to cover themselves with those veils. We can also assume that this insistence was based on religious reasons uh, for some of them. However, there is little indication that non-compliance with the bans were expressed in religious terms. In fact, the local authorities were very careful in framing the anti veiling campaigns, and they were building the propaganda for them by making the argument that the Peche and the Charshaf were not Islamic. They were Arab inventions, actually. Uh, so Islam's veiling norms didn't include face covering and the Charshaf type of full body cover uh, type of uh, outdoor uh, clothing. There was deliberate effort to make sure that the anti-veiling campaigns didn't come across as against Islam. In addition, women's non-compliance can also be partly understood within the patriarchal and conservative social dynamics by which women were surrounded, especially in smaller provinces. The conservativeness of the society regarding women's public appearance was a major concern for women in the issue of veiling or unveiling. The extent of the pressure, patriarchal and conservative character of the society put on women can be traced in the harassment and physical attacks some women faced by stranger men because they removed their veils. In other words, while some bands in certain provinces were put into court by some local authorities by using police, either the municipal police, Zalbata, or really directly police or the gendarme. And despite Ankara's continuous advice not to do so, and that's very, very critical. So Ankara consistently uh, said no, no use of force in this issue. And nevertheless, you see local authorities actually doing it. Uh, hold on. There were also cases where women were harassed and physically attacked by men who were strangers to them because they removed the Charshaf and Peche. In other words, in addition to labeling, gossiping, social exclusion, which would already make women's daily lives were very difficult, women also had to cope with the threat of physical attacks in case of unwaving. This meant that women were basically caught between two patriarchal forces. On the one hand, religious concerns, traditional habits, social and family pressures surrounding women certainly played an indispensable role in their attitudes towards unveiling. On the other hand, the pressures coming from the local state authorities created yet another obstacle for women trying to realize their own preferences and choices as individuals. In addition to these factors, and not less important than them, there were also economic reasons that limited women's ability to comply with the new dress codes. Because anti veiling campaigns promoted the replacement of the charsha with an overcoat and represented the overcoat, mantle, as the modern outdoor clothing of women, removal of the charsha was equated with the adoption of an overcoat which was very unfamiliar to people in 1930s Turkey, in short supply, and if it was available in the provinces, it was very expensive, right? Okay. There, were several uh, there are several experience, uh, examples of women reaching out to the local authorities, as well as authorities in Ankara. Women directly sent telegraphs even to Atatürk on this indicating their willingness to follow the new dress codes, but at the same time complaining that there was an economic cost to that uh, and they were unable to accommodate that cost. 
Uh, so in a nutshell, I have to, again, as I'm in the same uh, destiny here, I have to run. The result was uneven, depending on really the dynamics and circumstances at a particular locality. On the, the other hand, women were also quite, at least some of them, quite willingly and enthusiastically removed the peche and the charshaf. Some women even were initiators of these campaigns in certain uh, province, uh, provinces. And this, uh, you know, uh, being the uh, initiators of these campaigns were not just limited to, uh, as often assumed, to just some really small group of elite women. I would actually say, argue, that women became much more involved in larger numbers in these campaigns after they gained their political rights. And for a very good reason, from their perspective, there was a direct link between the removal of these type of veiling and their public visibility and participation in public life. Because this was not just an issue of floating, it was a struggle against women's seclusion and gender segregation. Now, to conclude, uh, let me summarize what I think the case of the anti veiling campaign shows us in terms of the actual impact of Kemalist gender policies. Now, there is no doubt that the anti veiling campaigns were ultimately state interventions in women's lives and thus should be seen as mechanisms of control and regulation. However, they were also ultimately shaped by women's agency and they provided women a potential space, a milieu to negotiate gender norms, especially concerning seclusion and segregation. In other words, ordinary women's encounters with the Kemalist ideal of modern Turkish woman had the potential to lead to various changes and transformations in practice that cannot be captured with conventional narratives of top-down modernization or binary frameworks like secular Kemalist elite versus religious society, uh, et cetera. The change in women's dress in early Republic was not a straightforward consequence of an imposed ideal or solely determined by a reform assumed to be implemented consistently. Rather, it was a social process that equally shaped, that was equally shaped by women's reactions and choices, the involvement of various local actors and dynamics that were hard to control or Ankara. So there was really a factor of state capacity as well in the story. The dynamic and complex process reveals that the Kemalist imagination and discourse of women, modern women, although it was very powerful in elite discourses and visual uh, representations of the regime, remained very much like an, as an ideal. And in practice, it was actually much more cautious and open to negotiation uh, than they have been taught to be. In fact, the Kemalist modern unveiled woman remains very much an ideal and the Kemalist elite hoped that it would one day and only gradually become a reality and only with the efforts of women. Then I will argue that the Kemalist gender policies opened up an opportunity space for women. And I'm not actually the you know, only or the first scholar to argue that I'm actually building on the, the very concept of opportunity space was used first by Denis Candiotti and then by Yoshimarat. So I'm actually building on the feminist scholarship that I uh, criticized at the beginning. What I'm suggesting here is that we expand that argument so that it includes uh, ordinary women in the provinces uh, uh, as well. So uh, my argument is that that opportunity space was opened up for women, at least to some of them, in the provinces uh, as well. So similar to Afsane Najmabadi's analysis of Iranian modernization, I would argue that the Kemalist project of uh, modernity can be seen as simultaneously regulatory controlling and enabling for women. Uh, and I think I will stop here.
uh, for the uh, sake of not going further. <laughs> 